I won't swear to it, but I think this is going to be the last of my uh, How to Do Life podcast. It's a series of my short, short stories that I read aloud to you uh, that are going to be part of my forthcoming book called Soloists, Short, Short Stories of People Who Tried to Make It Alone. Uh, this first one is called I Hate Myself. A lot of the time I hate myself. I hate my belly. I can't believe that at 16 I am already a little overweight. Why can't I be like the other girls who can eat the school lunch without blimping out? I also hate the way I think. Girls wear t-shirts like women rule, the future is female, and unstoppable. But I don't feel unstoppable. I feel very stoppable. And I feel guilty about thinking, let alone saying, that a guy would get killed for wearing a t-shirt that said men rule or that the future is male. And I feel guilty that I tend to be biased against a southern accent, whether it's a white person or a black person. And I'm confused. In my English and social studies classes, they say that making generalizations based on unlimited data is racist and sexist. Yet our science and math teachers urge us to make inferences based on limited data. I remember my statistics teacher saying something like, we must make inferences based on the probability that come from small samples. If we only make decisions after considering a massive amount of data, we'd still be living in caves. So I feel safer in my science and math classes, but I still feel guilty and hate myself. Okay, though that story is called I Hate Myself. The next one is called The Box. Michael just buried his father, literally. He was a ditch digger. He stopped at the library on the way home, yes, to find the novel, but also because the library was his bathroom, including, quote, shower. He took off his shirt, rubbed a squirt of soap under his arms, tried to rinse without getting all wet, and dried with paper towels. At Trader Joe's, he bought a jar of peanut butter, a bag of rice crackers, some celery, apples, and a mini rose plant. He passed the paint store and ended under the freeway, which was home. More precisely, his home was a nook behind the storage shed, which afforded a ribbon of sun. And that's where he planted his rose. He settled into his sleeping bag and pictured his father trudging from his apartment in New York weather to the train, to his job sewing shirts. And after 10 hours, he would trudge back and did it until age 82. And today, Michael, who also was a trudger, buried him. One day, as Michael returned from work, he saw a sign near home, Freeway Demolition 312.22 to 315.22. Like San Francisco's Central Freeway, which had been torn down to push people to use mass transit and to eliminate freeways in low-income areas, the government was demolishing the freeway that sheltered his nook. On March 12th, nothing happened, nor on March 13th or March 14th. But when he returned from work on the 15th, his overpass was gone, and his sleeping bag and few possessions were buried in rubble. What would his father tell him to do? Son, you can't go back to your nook because you'd be exposed to the elements, but don't go to a shelter. The noise is so bad you can't sleep and you may get robbed, and don't sleep in a doorway either. Michael agreed, if only because the rose wouldn't get sun in a doorway. His father concluded, you're a wise man, you'll figure out what to do. Michael did his best thinking while walking, so he padded down the streets. Soon he saw two men unloading a refrigerator from a truck. They then removed the box's heavy plastic wrapping, slid the refrigerator out of the box, the corners of that box which had were reinforced with wood, moved the refrigerator onto a dolly, and wheeled it into the apartment building. When the delivery men came out, Michael asked if he could have the box, and they agreed. And when, then Michael shoved the plastic into the box, dragged it back to his nook, dug out his buried possessions, and crawled inside the box. Michael hated that his home looked ugly and that the cardboard would collapse in the first rain, but got an idea. He strode to the paint store, bought a wide paintbrush and a narrow one, a knife, a stapler, and three cans from the mismatched paint section. Butter yellow for the body, French blue for shutters, quote unquote shutters, and apricot for the quote unquote trim. He painted the box, stapled the plastic around it, 
and cut an opening for a window for sunlight and a view of his rose. He imagined his father saying, I told you, you were wise. So that story is called The Box. The next one is called A Teacher's Dilemma. Hannah, or Hannah, I don't know how you want to pronounce it, always knew she wanted to be a teacher. She always admired her teachers, always tried to please them, and they showed their appreciation by giving her praise and great grades. It was a virtuous circle. So when it came time for Hannah to choose a career, even though she had non-teacher-like spiky hair with a purple wisp and five multicolored earrings in her left ear to reflect her politics, she applied for middle school teaching jobs. She wanted that age group because that's when, in a hormonal frenzy, she had hated school, hated her parents, hated everything but her edgy friends, her makeup, and her too loud music. Hannah's first year of teaching was tough. Kiss, kids misread her niceness as weakness and would fool around. Once, a kid got into her face and said, You ain't my mother, you can't make me. Another time, Hannah touched an angry boy's shoulder to try to calm him down, and he spat, Get your hands off me, I'll tell the principal you were abusing me. But Hannah soon learned how to strike the balance between kindness and firmness, and the kids liked her, and she liked them, although she was always disappointed at the slow progress her classes made on the standardized tests. Half failed to reach even the basic proficiency level in reading. Two-thirds failed to do so in math. Hannah also wasn't enamored of the new curriculum. It was longer on rigor and identity politics than on activities that would motivate kids. And with each passing year, she wondered if she should take her father's offer to come into his wholesale industrial chemical business. But net, Hannah was still enjoying teaching. And there was the mere 177-day school year, six-hour and 20-minute school days, and 10 of those were, quote, minimum days for staff development, plus lifetime job security, full benefits, full pension. In short, she was golden handcuffed. But then there was COVID. The 2021 and the first half of the 21-22 school years were remote, and Hannah felt embarrassed at how little learning could be accomplished on Zoom. She was heartened in spring 2022, when in-person classes resumed, cases and hospitalizations had declined, and thus the, sum the coming school year promised to be fully in person. But in May 2022, analyses of sewage, which is the most accurate predictor of the future of COVID, indicated a likely resurgence of the more del virulent Delta variant, which would presage a likely return to remote teaching and uh, probably a remote not much learning. Hannah sat at home staring at the contract for the upcoming school year and thought, so that story is, is called The Teacher's Dilemma. Um, I think I'm going to let you know what you're listening to. You're listening to How to Do Life. I'm Marty Nemco. I'm going to take just a few second break so that the uh, announcer can make her do her announcement thing, and I hope you'll stay with me. Okay, thank you for staying with me. I'm reading uh, probably the final set of uh, short, short stories for my forthcoming book, Soloists. Uh, short, short stories of people who tried to make it alone. This next one is called A Smiler. Joyce's smile was broader than most. When she saw her daughter in a nice outfit, she beamed. When her boss gave her a promotion, she jumped up and down. And when the love of her life asked her to marry, she screamed joy. Even bad events didn't make her frown. When her mother died, a wisp of a smile seeped through her grief. When her best friend lost her job, she smiled and assured her friend that she'd get a better one. Even when she got her end-stage cancer diagnosis, she smiled and said, I've had a good life. Her grandson finally came to see her when she was on her deathbed and said, Grandma, you've taught me to smile. I use that with every customer. I use it with every girl I date. Joyce noted the word use and frowned. So that story is called A Smiler. The next story is called An Unkind Cut. Ethan always had higher standards for people than could always be met. As a child, he always covered his test paper when classmates tried to copy his answers. A dermatologist now, when his patients would no-show or fail to do what was required, for example, put ointment on a wound, he'd fire the patient. 
on a first date, no matter how cute or flirtatious. If she was unintelligent, evil, or self-absorbed, he summarily dropped her. His high standards frustrated him with normal humankind, and one time he went over the edge. A patient both no-showed and didn't change his bandage, so it got infected. And the patient blamed the doctor. You didn't tell me I needed to do it every day. The doctor had. So when he told the patient about the biopsy results, which was that the lesion was benign and could safely be ignored, Ethan lied and said it was a skin cancer that needed to be cut out. Ethan felt good afterward. Anyway, that story is called An Unkind Cut. The next story is called Feedback. The usual response was no response. I felt lucky even to get a form letter rejection. There were so many excellent submissions. The usual feedback was no feedback. It's not quite right for us, best of luck. So I tried submitting to outlets the promised feedback for a fee. I joined a writer's group. I even spent the $1,995 for a week-long famed writer's workshop. I got feedback, but wasn't confident that it would levitate me over the golden threshold into the land of the published. Some of the feedback felt too global. For example, your chapters are too episodic. Episodic is insider speak for chapters insufficiently integrated with each other. Or, the feedback felt too granular. I wish Doreen's rationale for choosing Tuskegee was spelled out more. Mostly, I didn't agree with the feedback. Much of it seemed like writing 101. Not that I'm James Joyce or Shakespeare or even Anthony Doerr. But imagine that they were told, get your protagonist up in a tree, throw rocks at him and get him down. Worst of all, I felt that if I incorporated much of the feedback, the work wouldn't be me anymore. It would be me hollowed out, stripped down, or adorned in an ill-suited outfit. Yes, I adopted a few of the suggestions. For example, replacing some adjectives with better verbs, pacing drama with breathing space, and eliminating extra words so the resulting soup was less dilute, more concentrated. But basically, I decided to hell with them. So I self-published my novel, which I called Before, I enjoyed having control over not just its words, but its formatting, and especially the cover, which was an impressionist hourglass with purple sand. I love that it was published and available on Amazon one day after I submitted the manuscript. To be honest, I've sold a grand total of 37 copies, actually six copies. I bought the other 31 to give as presents. But I've started on the sequel. It's during, and then after, hope to write after. So that story is called Feedback. Uh, the next story is called Irrelevant. I wasn't the one who made up my campaign slogan, The Voice of Reason. It's what a colleague in the state senate said about me when the extremists of both parties were being irrational about a piece of immigration legislation. But that was in 2016. Things have changed a lot since then. In the 2020 campaign, activists uh, dishonestly used social media to try to get me to step aside. In liberal strongholds, my opponents countless signs along highways, on lawns, even graffiti trumpeted, Jim, it's our time now. Pow! With the media subtly, uh, not so subtly often, uh, supporting my opponent and their social media fundraising dwarfing mine, plus my refusal to go negative, no surprise, I lost. Although I was already 66 at the time, I felt I still had a lot to contribute as, yes, a voice of moderation. So I swallowed my pride and did the rare thing of running for lower office, city council in the small city in which I was born and had long lived. And although I lost by only 61 votes, I did lose, again to a fiery opponent whose message was in line with the zeitgeist. Now what? I had always been a hard worker. My colleagues assumed that was because I cared so much about people, about more wisely using taxpayers' hard-earned dollars, and about being that voice of moderation. But that wasn't the only reason I worked hard. For my entire life, I used work to distract me from my hypochondria. Even though I knew it was irrational, even my happy times were tainted by a cloud of worry that I had or soon would get some horrible disease. And every sensation of ambiguous origin turned that cloud into a torrent of fear and visits to the doctor who felt forced to do tests, even an invasive endoscopy one time. All the results of the tests were negative, but I felt reassured only briefly before worry started to reinfect my mind. In addition to work, I also used guitar playing as a distraction. 
I'd volunteer to play at my friends' parties, mainly show tunes and standards, like my mom's favorite, Autumn Leaves. But with such music totally out of fashion, even among, among older people, I soon found those invitations dwindling. Now, the only invitations I get are from nursing homes. But seeing those very old, often dying people fed my hypochondria, so I had to stop doing that. Yes, I've occasionally had flashes of anger about having become irrelevant, but my main feeling has been sadness, growing sadness. My fear of disease has waned. What do I have to live for anyway? Indeed, my hypochondria has largely been replaced by thoughts of suicide. I don't think I have the courage to do it. I think. Okay, so that story uh, was called Irrelevant. And the next story is called Suddenly Old. Clarissa's discipline had paid off. She made it all the way to become the Midwest Ballet Theater's principal ballerina, having sacrificed her childhood. She successfully fought her tendency to gain weight with an anorexic ballet diet, in which she both uh, recorded every one of her 900 calories a day and posted her weight every day on Facebook. She practiced her ballet six hours a day and felt she was being a slacker when she only practiced two hours on Christmas Day. In her 50s, that discipline enabled Clarissa to get selected for major roles in the National Senior Ballet Company, but at age 56, she started to have pain in her hip. She thought it was normal aging, exacerbated by 50 years of ballet, but it was arthritis, rapidly progressing arthritis. Within six months, Clarissa went from limber dancer to having trouble getting up and down stairs into the car, and she was even limping a bit. Her doctor was optimistic that a hip replacement would restore her to nearly her pre-arthritis self, but that turned out to be too optimistic. After the three-month, often painful recovery, yes, she could walk and climb stairs, but her dancing days were over. Dancing had been her entire life, so she tried teaching dance, but was frustrated at students' lack of discipline. She tried managing a dance studio, but was frustrated with teachers, students, and parents. A few months later, she developed arthritis in the other hip and in the knee, is taking pain medication for those, but probably is facing more surgery. She thought, I thought you get old gradually. I felt young and then poof, I'm old. Clarissa bought a chocolate fudge cake and Ben and Jerry's chunky monkey ice cream, put them out on her table and stared. So uh, that story is called Suddenly Old. Uh, the next story, I think it's the last one, yeah, the last one is called The Moment I Most Regret. I was so sad to see Grandpa. I remember him as smart and energetic, and then, at the end, I had procrastinated going to see him because I was so afraid of what he'd look like. I was afraid of seeing all the tubes, the IV bottle, the clump of pill bottles. I was afraid I wouldn't know the right thing to say. I could try to explain away my procrastination by telling you that I was only 12 at the time, but I was old enough. I should have seen him more. I'll never forget the last time I saw him. It is the moment I most regret. All my fears were confirmed. He was frightening to look at. Even though he was at home, there were more tubes, more machines than I had even imagined, and well above his headboard where he couldn't see it was a sign, do not resuscitate. After I said, hi, Grandpa, and he responded by waving his fingers at me, I couldn't say anything smarter than, how are you? What was he supposed to say? I'm dying. How are you? He whispered, I'm okay with it all. Don't worry. He took a deep breath so he could talk more. Daniel, I want to leave you a treasure. Idiot me thought about he was referring to gold and jewels. That wasn't what he meant. He said, the greatest treasure I could give you are just three words. The first was work, because a worthwhile life is about being productive. You could spend your life watching sitcoms and be happy, but your life would have been worth it. The second word was merit. Today, being of the, quote, right race and gender counts when hiring people or selecting them for college. That means that merit counts less, and that hurts the better person who wasn't selected. It hurts the coworkers, it hurts the customers, and it ultimately hurts all of us. And the third word is you. It's easy to blame your problems on other people and on society. Yes, those affect things, but you have more control than you think. When crap happens, make yourself rebound. Always take the next step forward. Yes, you, you can do it. I remember crying. 
not because of Grandpa's wise words or because he was dying, but because I was expecting a real treasure. Then I got angry, huffed goodbye, and stormed out. I'm now 90, and that was the moment I most regret in my entire life. I've tried to live by his three words, and now that I'm on my deathbed, I hope I have the wisdom to say the right thing to each person who comes to say goodbye to me. I am guessing that there is a do not resuscitate sign over my bed. I'm hoping I'll at least say that I'm okay with it all. Don't worry. In any event, those are, uh, I think, nine uh, short, short stories uh, uh, from my forthcoming book, Soloists, uh, stories of people who tried to make it alone. I do thank you for watching. Uh, welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel. The subscribe button should be on the right on your screen. And in any event, I do thank you for watching. I am Marty Nemco.